All right, well, ooh, that works. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Jody Menich, and I am actually not with Leap. I'm just a really big fan of Leap. I'm a former employee of Leap, um, and I'm a UX designer. And hey, I'm Daniel, and uh, I'm a design engineer with Leap Motion. Uh, we build all of our like UX demos and prototypes and do a lot of our user research and that sort of thing. So we've been collaborating quite a bit on um, creating some VR tools using Leap Motion, and we're going to talk to you today about some of the work that we've done on developing best practices around uh, designing for AR, VR, and, and motion. So first, let's just quickly get out of the way of the, uh, the landscape of devices right now. I, I, it's, it's very much the wild, wild west. Um, there, there are a number of different types of devices. There's a number of different types of platforms that you can design for the devices on, um, but yet there is absolutely no standards, right? We don't really know what the equivalent of the blue underline link is yet. Um, how many of you were around in 94 when we designed for the web? Wow. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> I was starting to think we were outdated. Okay. So remember, uh, so the problem that we had in 94, and we're, and I like to say that we're kind of in the same boat now, is that we didn't have any standards. We didn't even um, know what, uh, you know, graphics platform we should use to publish to the web. Um, and the only thing that we could rely on was the fact that we could either anchor the content to the top left or the center, and we could use blue underline links. And that was pretty much all that we had available to us. And we're in the same kind of boat right now with VR because there is no standard platform yet. We're still in the process of even um, figuring out what VR is, let alone what's the standard of VR. Um, can you push the things? So there's pretty much two categories falling out right now. Um, the first one is the minimum viable product. And I don't mean this in an insulting way. I mean to say that these are the most reliable, they're, they're taking the most reliable technologies that we have out there and putting them out into the marketplace. So these are things like the um, Samsung gear pictured here, Google Cardboard, these kinds of products that are using your cell phone and amplifying it into um, VR. I would also, at this time, Please don't take offense to this. I would also put um, DK, the DK2 into this category because it's got very limited functionality beyond giving you a sense of um, head vector and, and presence. You know, you're looking at something, and then you have to use something else to do input on that particular product. And then there's the big bets. And now, granted, I'm biased towards this category because I did work on HoloLens. <laughs> so um, these are the, the devices that are looking at how they can use um, multiple sensors to create a more immersive experience. So on HoloLens, we were using things, you know, like, like your head vector, but also using gesture. Um, also looking at the, the consistency of your space, trying to create some sort of way that you can anchor content to the real world. And the same is true with, uh, uh, Valve. Valve's doing some really interesting stuff along this line. Um, <coughs> and there's, you know, Magic Leap, uh, very few people have actually seen what Magic Leap is in reality, but the, the videos look really exciting, and, and they I would put them into this, uh, this category. And we get to scour through their patents yeah. from time to time whenever those get filed. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, so uh, given that is our current landscape, right, there's really no standards, again, like I said. So given today's devices, we're going to give you a little bit of overview of what is what works and what doesn't work. And I want to start with what is AR VR bad at? Number one. Legible text. So, <laughs> so right now, um, Samsung Gear is actually probably the best display that we've seen um, that for legibility of text that's on the marketplace right now. It's still not something, though, that I want to spend hours of my time in reading text. I just don't want to do that. It's really, uh, it's, it, the refresh rate's really uncomfortable, the latencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not to just that project, product, just that's the status of this stuff now. So we've done a lot of experimenting um, around how to make things more legible. Uh, um, and, you know, the biggest problem is that the focal depth is 1.5 meters in an arc. And you're asking people to read a flat piece of paper. Um, and so actually my, my eyes can't adjust to follow that piece of paper like they can in the real world, right? Like your eyes actually making minor adjustments as you move from one side of the page to the other. But in VR space, you can't do that because you really only have this one focal plane and everything is just an illusion beyond that. And there's a lot of lensing effects too. Like the, the way that VR gives you things like peripheral vision and the, a lot of the, tr the graphical tricks. If you've ever seen like the, 
uh, when you, you actually just see the raw Oculus display like this, where you've got these warps. A lot of these give you great effects in VR, but can contribute to a lot of text legibility issues. And this stuff's getting better, but it's going to take time, and there's still going to be a continuum of devices that are affected here. Right. So some of the tricks that we've tried are publishing on a concave surface and uh, high contrast. Um... Yeah, managing your backgrounds and managing your contrast, avoiding typefaces that are going to have a lot of aliasing issues, and really bumping up the anti-aliasing in whatever you're doing to make sure that text appears crisp and smooth. Um, doing things like if you're using... Um, if you're using a lot of bitmap text and things like that, having what are called mipmaps, which handle uh, smoothly blurring and smoothly uh, downsizing things as they get further away. Uh, also, you tend to expect in VR that you'd have a really big safe zone for text that you could you have a lot of space to deal with. The truth of the matter is, it's actually a lot smaller than what we tend to expect. It's a very small cone right in the small middle of your vision, spot. and this gets better with some of like the next generation headsets, like the Crescent Bay uh, from Oculus and uh, like the HTC Vive are doing a lot better at this, but we're going to, as designers, have to deal with uh, not really having a great amount of area within which your eyes can flit around. You end up having to move your head a lot, things like that. Which is fine because um, we would like to encourage you to think beyond 2D. Yeah. So um, the next problem that uh, VR has is with tactile feedback there's no tactile feedback in VR. You're, you have these objects, and even if you're moving around and trying to touch them, you don't actually get any feedback when you touch them. So um, this is going to be a problem for a while, right? So like HTC and the cardboard that I mentioned, they have a little tactile feedback because you're interacting with the device to provide the click. Um, some people are using um, an external mouse as a method to provide that click. Um, but... Uh, it's really hard to find where that mouse is. Um, so one thing that we've found to be very successful is using sound effects and visual um, afford or visual animations to make it seem as if you're feeling something tactile, and it actually goes a really long way. It's very, it's really cool to see somebody freak out and think that you're putting something on their hand on your hand when it's really just the the illusion that you're feeling something. So one thing that we tried was a Tesla ball, and um, you know, just like in the real world, you know, Tesla balls are those glass balls, and they've got the sparks of electricity flying around in them. And and when you touch them, you don't actually feel anything. Even in the real world, you just touch the glass, but you always kind of think your hands are gonna get zapped. And the same is true in in VR. People like actually thought that their hands were heating up or something, um, but really it was just an illusion based on the sound effects and the and the animation. Yeah, it's actually for a lot of the stuff I've been working on recently. I've been using when our user testers start to say, "I," it's like I can feel this, or I feel a warm thing on my arm, or things like that. Uh, that's kind of been a metric for me that we're getting closer to the right visual effects. We're getting closer to the right auditory. Uh, kind of stimuluses and things that are going to make this a really immersive experience and make it something people can start to believe in. Uh, it's It's been really cool to see that same piece of feedback consistently across really a wide variety of, of experiences. And then the last thing that VR is really bad at is the real world. Um, this is especially true about VR, because basically what you're doing is putting on a light-proof um, blindfold on your face, and um, asking people to move around is very dangerous in that situation. You see a woman, young woman here being assisted by the people around her to move around in VR. So what we really recommend is that you think about the fact that when I'm in VR, it's really not safe for me to get up and move around. So you're going to want to think about experiences where I can be seated or maybe I can stand and turn 360, but, but don't expect me to move a bunch because I'm, I mean, We'll show you in just a second here with the DK2. There's lots of cords and things, and people really quickly fall over and very, very quickly get disoriented because they have no real-world cues to understand where they are spatially. And this is again kind of something where there's the caveat of there's people working on this. There's things like the the Vive has what they call their their lighthouse sensors that can project the the real-world walls and obstacles into the virtual space. And there's a bunch of other folks like we're working on. Um, with Leap Motion, we're working on a new device that can give you full RGB high-res video stereoscopically into your headset. And with that, we've done things like we've kind of we've tried juggling in the office. We've played catch with things, and where everyone's wearing VR headsets and shouldn't be able to see a thing. It's actually really funny. We've gotten to the point where we assume that if someone's got a headset on, there's a fair chance they can see you. 
uh, just because of having these sorts of pass-through effects. So these are things that are being worked on, but with the wide variety of it, kind of systems that people are going to be deploying VR on, it's definitely something you're going to want to take into account, know your platform, and know what's happening when you're building things for this. Right. So we've given you the bad, but now let's talk about the good. So what is a, uh, a and VR good at? And that is space. Right. This is the first time that we have been able to really expand uh, technology into the into a dimensional world. Um, we, I like to say we've gotten our peanut butter and our chocolate and our chocolate and our peanut butter. It's finally a time where we can put our digital objects into our real world and benefit from both. Right. So we can benefit. We can we can understand how humans use the real world and the way that we use space in the real world. And now we can put our digital objects into that real world. Um, so, so um, uh, one thing that I want to say that before, sorry, before I move on is that um, people in the real world we use space very deliberate, uh, very efficiently. We actually are constantly creating an understanding of the space around us. We have a, uh, innately in our brain, we're constantly building a spatial map of where everything is, and that's what's helping me to not run into the wall when I walk backwards here. Um, oops. Um, <laughs> right, and it also helps me to like catch a ball, like I can, I know where that is. But it also helps me to remember when I remember to put my keys in the right spot where my keys are, or to um, understand and reveal relationships between um, different. Objects, right? I can tell what their relationship is to one another just by looking at them. And um, now we finally have that opportunity for for technology, and that's really exciting. So one thing that VR is um, being already showing lots of promise in is in creating spatial relationships between objects. So this is an example um, of NASA uh, scientists. So they were they they were looking at 2D images that were sent back from the Mars rover. Rover. And they had um, different cartographers try to determine where an object was spatially. And so to create a map of what these landmarks are and where they are on Mars. And there was a lot of disagreement about where that object is because the 2D information just didn't provide enough, uh, enough detail for them to understand where that object is, especially the atmosphere on Mars is nothing like ours. So everything's in focus, right? And then... Um, they started to use the, the 3D data that they were getting back. And it's amazing how quickly these same cartographers were able to agree upon where objects were in space because they had this more spatial understanding of just the 2D images that they were looking at. It may not be complete VR or 3D information, like they couldn't completely walk around a space. But just giving them that little bit more of a cue of the spatial relationships allowed them much more quickly. And these are really experienced cartographers having that data completely change the way that they thought about that space. So it's really powerful stuff. The other thing that space is really good at, uh, VR space is really good at, is multitasking. There's lots and lots of studies that show that um, in large MON and multi-MON environments, uh, there's a huge pro productivity gain in allowing users to spatially arrange their um, tasks so that they can navigate simply by, you know, moving their head through the space as opposed to navigating between different tabs on the, on the, um, uh, sorry, the little bar at the bottom. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, they can, <laughs> they can more quickly move between things and that can lead to upwards of 40% improvement in productivity. This is huge. This is giant. So if we think about how VR is now this infinite canvas and now I can arrange my tasks spatially in this, um, this vast environment as opposed to the flat screens of my monitors, um, how much more improvement we can get through through this type of multitasking. The other thing that um, is very, really exciting is the simulation. Um, this is Elite Dangerous. I don't know if you guys have ever played this game in VR, but I highly recommend it. It's kind of amazingly breathtaking. Um, it's really, really fantastic. And it's an experience that was built for both desktop and for VR. And it's a way you could get a really good sense of what the kind of what the value out of VR is and how that and also get a good sense for what things on desktop don't work as well when you're working in VR. There's a few things in here that can get super frustrating. So it's a it's a really good test case if you have a chance to take a look at it. Highly recommend it. Um, but the thing is, is that you can be dropped into environments in VR that you would never be able to go to in the real world, right? Like, I can't go to space. I don't have any ability to do that, but I can put this headset on and suddenly I'm in space. The other thing that there, this, this particular part of VR is being used for is situation, 
situational therapies, for example. So let's say that a, um, a soldier returning from the war has very bad PTSD. You can put them into an environment that they would, um, that caused the PTSD to begin with, but in a safe, um, therapeutic type of way so that they can deal with their trauma in a, in a safe environment. So it's very, um, the, the suspension of disbelief is really easy because you're surrounded 360 by this environment. And so you can quickly, um, your brain quickly starts to immerse itself into that environment as long as you uh, do your best to keep them in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing that we want to talk about um, on a general level is fake limbs. And I totally forgot again to check the study. Anyways, um, this is a study that was done, and I will have to give you the citation after the talk. Sorry about that. Um, it's a really cool study. Basically, what they did was they wanted to know, could they, um, could you use proprioception to control the third arm, right? So in VR, um, we see these really interesting things. For example, I was talking about spatial cognition earlier. Well, studies show that you can actually develop spatial cognition in VR. So we can develop these kinds of cognitive things that we can do in the real world in a virtual reality. And this one, what they were doing was they were looking at how you develop a sense of proprioception, and then they gave the user a third arm, and users really quickly, like within 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of using it, were able to control their third arm as if they were using their other limbs. It was really, really quick. So it's really fascinating how quickly you can adjust to another image of, of your being just by being in this environment. And you've had some experiments with this. Yeah, this has been actually really interesting. A project we're working on right now uh, has involved us switching between a number of different avatars that we're embodying it, it, and doing it rather quickly. And so I've had the experience of going from feeling like I'm about seven feet tall with the equivalent arm span, and then in the same space being about five foot three and having like a much shorter arm span and having all, kind of all of the perspective changes that come along with that. And when it initially happens, it's pretty shocking, and your body takes a moment to acclimate, and it can, it, it's actually kind of a, a, an interestingly powerful experience to, to quickly embody a bunch of different people. But the speed at which uh, your brain acclimates, and this has been true for my entire team, has been really, really, just surprisingly fast. You get very used to it, and even though if you take the headset off and kind of switch back and forth, you can see that there's not a lot of alignment. My arms are far longer than they are in this in this application. My brain solves for all of that, and it's able to very, very quickly can become really deft. And the other interesting thing is, once I've gotten used to it and I switch away, even if I'm coming back to it days later, I'm, I can very, very quickly pick up that same amount of like my proprioception deals with it properly, and I can very quickly jump and reacclimate into that uh, into that embodiment. So it's pretty amazing what the plasticity of our brains and what they can do. And you just have to, and we'll get into this a little more. You have to kind of ease people into it properly uh, to make it not a negative experience, um, which. We're learning a lot of that on, on our projects. We kind of say so we're finding new and interesting ways to assault the senses. Um, <laughs> but if you do it right, you can create some incredibly powerful experiences with this. Great. So that's our overview of what's happening. Now we're going to start to talk about some um, specifics around best practices. So the first one, before I say anything else, please don't make me sick. Please. I am very sensitive to motion sickness. And in fact, um, lots of women happen to be um, sensitive to motion sickness. And it's very easy in VR to make somebody very, very sick. Um, the first time I put VR, uh, DK1 on, I actually threw up within 30 seconds. So um, it's really easy to do. And there's some very basic ways not to make people sick. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. First of all is the latency. Um, some, some devices handle this better than others. Um, but as much as you can do on your side to remove the latency um, in frame rate is going to be very important. You want to have zero latency if you can possibly do it. Of course you can't, but it's helpful to do that. The other thing is that um, you don't want to make large scenic movements. You don't want to move the user without them instigating the movement, right? Like you don't want to suddenly take them from here all the way to the back of the room without them knowing what's happening because that's going to, just like in the real world, like if you suddenly were thrown to the side, you'd feel a little sick from it. The other thing um, is that if the horizon line moves unpredictably or in large ways, that will also make the user sick. So just keep in mind that any sort of movement that you want to do, you want the user to instigate. The other thing is that when you, when it comes to like flashing UI or something like that, don't freeze the scene. Still, like maybe I have a dialogue box sitting in front of my face about here. Don't, please don't put it closer. Uh, about here. 
And, um, but I still want to be able to move my head around and see the rest of the environment with this thing fixed in it. I don't want to suddenly be frozen in looking, into looking at this and have it go with me, because that's going to instantly make me sick. Um, something else I'm forgetting about? Uh, we, had the, we had a really interesting with the horizon line thing. Yeah. Um, and this is just kind of fun stories from the world of VR. Um, we had a virtual reality planetarium that we're building, and we'll actually show a little bit about it later. But one of the things you could do is you could fly around the Earth. And when we were first prototyping this, <laughs> <laughs> when we were first prototyping this, um, I some combination of getting the altitude above the Earth and the lighting in the scene and everything just right, when I started, we kind of were building this kind of virtual joystick. And when I started pushing forward and rolling the Earth, it felt very keenly like I was about to go rolling down a gigantic hill. Mm. Um, and it felt like I was rolling forward. Apparently, what I was actually doing was I was rolling back in my chair and successfully <laughs> fell right back out of it. <laughs> um, so it's really, it's, it's actually really easy to get lost in these experiences. And so when weird things do happen, especially if things have been going normally for a while, if something kind of is weird and jolting, it can be very, it can be very disconcerting and possibly dangerous. Right. And well, and to that point, though, the reason why it makes you sick is because what happens is that your body is telling your brain that it's standing still and your eyes are telling your brain that it's moving. And so what your brain decides is that you've taken some sort of drug and it wants it out of your system immediately and it must <laughs> evacuate everything. So don't do that. Speaking of which. Speaking of which. Um, here's, our, here's our last cautionary tale. Um, create virtual safety goggles. And by what this, what I, what I mean to say is that when you first get into the scene, right, don't put something right here and make it at a comfortable distance because what happens is is that if it's too close, you can't focus your eyes just because of the nature of the device. Like I said, everything's rendering at a distance of 1.1 to 1.5, depending on the device. And if you're putting something here, my eyes can't do the thing that they can do in the real world to adjust, which is that I make micro, um, it's called convergence, my eyes start to come together so that I can read stuff that's closer. I can't do that in VR because it's not actually rendering closer. It's actually here, but I think it's here. And so my brain goes crazy and it hurts. Um, and also, um, if you're going to send things at me, um, keep in mind that I'm going to freak out. Oh, sorry. So it's here. And now I can't move my head back because it's attached to my head. So I do this to kind of like try to focus on it. It keeps coming and it's just the most obnoxious feeling in the world. So, so be careful about that. The other thing is that when things come flying at your face, your natural inclination is to protect your eyeballs. And so you kind of want to keep in mind that there's like this safety zone that will make people feel comfortable. Even if they're like walking through walls, you still want to like get rid of those walls before they hit my eyes. Because even though it's not actually hurting my eyes, I'm going to think it does. And it's going to do the same thing as motion sickness does. In fact, that's what caused me to puke. Um, the, there was a wall. When I, when I put the goggles on, somebody else had tried it, and they were looking this way. And then I put them on, and I was looking this way, which happened to be right in the middle of a, of a uh, pillar. And because it was so close to my face, that's what made me get sick. So you should be careful about that. So here's where we start the fun part. So it's more like the, designing VR um, and AR applications is more like designing a room with a bunch of tools that it is like designing a 2D flat screen with buttons. And that's a very important distinction to keep in mind as you're doing this. Is because the right when when I have a 2D screen, I know that when I push my finger here, I'm going to hit this thing here. But but if you'll notice, my, the trajectory of my hand to get to this thing is kind of sloppy. I can come from this angle, I can come from this angle, I can go like this. Those are all valid because I have a 2D element that I'm trying to hit. But in VR, there is no plane. There's no plane that I'm trying to hit. And so now we have to think about different ways to design that, that affordance to get the user to do the right action. So one of the applications we've been working on, and I do really love this picture because this is actually what some of our user testing looks like. And we have people just like all over the office just waving their hands around and they look like bad men and it's fantastic. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the things we've, we ran into really early on with this project, and actually I'm going to, it is better to show than tell. And so yep. let's see if we can do this without creating a budget item. Uh, t -t -t yeah, you got it. Yep. Awesome. Um, wow, the duplication of displays. 
So um, this is a so virtual good. reality planetarium that we built. And this was what I would kind of describe as one of our first forays into trying to define a set of best practices for motion-controlled VR and trying to figure out what, what really works and what doesn't. So there were some successful and less successful things in here. Uh, and one of the things we ran into was building this arm HUD. And when we first started building it, and we'll, we, I think we'll talk a little later about kind of some more details about this, but we didn't immediately consider all of the ways that people might start like coming at this or interacting with it and all of the different ways that our UI would have to adapt. So there's actually a lot of kind of springs and physical things, and running all these screens is really making this MacBook unhappy. I bet. Speaking of uh, frame rate. But the... Um, the, when we first came in here, we had things like throwing your hand would actually cause all of the springs and the buttons to fire, and we would simultaneously fire every button in the application, and that got really unfortunate. So um, just moving your arm like this would push all the buttons at or, the same time. <laughs> or we have things that uh, change the time of day and the orbit of the Earth and would actually throw the Earth and the 3D engine across the like, far across the scene, and every single UI element would freak out. So both from like a design and an engineering perspective, you have to be really aware of all the different things that are going to happen in VR because you're moving through a three-dimensional space. So like a lot of the UI libraries we were using in the Unity game engine had no concept of this, and we ended up having to rewrite a bunch of them. So you have to think a lot about this while you're building these sorts of things. So in essence, what Dave, Daniel is saying is the fact that, you know, because this thing was moving around in space, right, we couldn't tell which direction somebody was trying to push it, and also just the act of moving it suddenly triggered a bunch of things that we didn't want to have triggered. So it's, it's, it is very much more about designing a physical space than it is a 2D element. Yeah, and this brings me to affordances. So... Um, us interaction designers, we stole this term from industrial designers a way back. And basically what an affordance is, is um, some element that affords proper use and um, negatively affords improper use, meaning um, the user has only has a very clear direction of what to do uh, to implement that or to activate that control just by looking at it. So the, this is a very famous example. Doorknobs, Norman pointed this out. <laughs> so... Um, you know, this, this one up here and the, these two on the left are really good affordances. I know exactly what to do by looking at them. I know that this one, um, in the, in the upper left is a doorknob that I grasp the handle here, right? And then I turn. And I can tell that by looking at it. This one here is a push bar. And I push on that bar and it opens. I would never try to do the same. I would never try to grab this and turn it because it doesn't afford that type of use. And I would never try to push on this one because it clearly wouldn't respond to my pushing. Now, you'll see these examples here. These are bad affordances. And the reason that they're bad affordances is because I don't know how many times I have pushed on something that was supposed to be pulled or pulled on something that was supposed to be pushed, which is why you have to label it like this. Because the affordance itself doesn't tell the user exactly what they should or shouldn't do. And the same can be said about VR affordances. This becomes really important in this world. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of funny. The experience we've had has been like coming from desktop and mobile design. When I think of having proper affordances, a lot of it comes down to using kind of the the visual language that people already understand from desktop and mobile and applying that properly to show people this is a button, this is a link, this isn't clickable, this is. In VR, we actually move back towards industrial design where today the my team and I were talking about the design of a knob that we're building and we were actually sculpting out forms and talking about the three-dimensional shapes of it so it makes sure that you know you don't want to grab this, you want to you want to slide this, you want to interact with this with your entire open hand versus trying to interact with this with a pointed finger. There's a number of things you get into, and actually we, we go over and talk to our industrial design and hardware team once in a while and try and get their help on, like, how, how, should, we, how should we create an affordance that actually works for this? So get, gaining things kind of back from architecture and back from industrial design is really relevant in VR. Yeah, and I can hear a bunch of designers out there sucking in some breath going, no, skeuomorphism! But that's not <laughs> what we're talking about. You can still do these kind of dimensional affordances without having to go heavily into the skeuomorphism. 
geomorphic world. It's that, especially since we're now entering into a new design language for these things. So thinking about how you might combine the two offers up a whole new opportunity of things. For example, like let's say that you have a button, right? Or you have something that you're, let's, let's rephrase that. You have something that you need to activate. And in 2D world, we might use a button, right? And again, I know how you're going to push that button. And even if you come at it like this, you're still going to hit the button. In VR, we might instead want to create a landing strip so that in, I'm t telling the user where to move their hand through space to do the same type of activity as opposed to giving them a solid target that they have to actively push in a very specific way, right? So you start to think about your affordances a little bit differently. And, and Daniel's got an example from uh, the... From the old planetarium. Yeah, from the planetarium. Back to our planetarium. The, um, so like Jody said at the, at the start, we're kind of in the Wild West right now. There's not a great set of... Or I'll talk and switch this at the same time. Yeah. There's not a great set of visual communication standards. There's not even a great set of consistent input devices yet. I mean, you know, from one demo to another, you might be using Elite Motion, then you might be using a gamepad, then you might be using a keyboard and a mouse. And so people really don't have a great concept of what's going to afford a push. Or in a lot of cases, people don't even have a concept that, uh, that reaching your hand out and pushing is even an option. And so one of the things we ran into on the planetarium was that... When you first get into the application, we, there's a start screen that has some buttons on it. And we, we made an effort to be visually consistent with our buttons. They all have a particular set of outlines. They all have a particular set of things. But I've watched a number of testers and a number of people like on YouTube videos who go in and they see this little icon and they go, why can't I press the Milky Way icon? And they like sit here just trying to press this. And we actually did three different visual iterations of this to try and reduce the amount that it looked like a button. Uh, whereas the actual buttons are here, and they, it's probably rather hard to see it uh, without the headset on, but there's a nice depth effect. They're actually and, dimensional. Like, yeah, they have, a, they have a bit of pop to them, and uh, we maintain a consistency across all of those different sets of things, and then we made sure to keep kind of the monochromatic flat set up for everything that wasn't interactable. But what, this, what we didn't do here and what would really have been helpful was having some time where we could scaffold users users up into understanding what set of affordances we were using, what our visual language was, and there's a whole set of techniques you can use to start to train people on this, but it's things we're just not accustomed to having to do if you're coming from desktop or mobile design or um, anything that has kind of a traditional set of known inputs. So even using those traditional 2D um, affordances in the, in the VR space, like Daniel's saying, wasn't effective enough because it was really hard to determine, uh, well, is that actually what you're talking about in this instance because it's VR and so people get a little confused. The other thing that we want to talk about is the fact that depth is an illusion. So even though you're in VR, it's not like you just put VR and suddenly you have, you put on these headsets and suddenly you have dimensionality. Like I said earlier, you know, they're all kind of rendering at the same depth. They're not actually rendering. Like, if I say an object is way back there by the cafe, it's not actually rendering as if it's way back there by the cafe. It's actually rendering at 1.5 meters from my face, depending on the headset that you're using. So you need to do something to help the user to understand this new depth that you're presenting them. So things like lighting cues, you know, the, the traditional ones that we use in, in trompe l'oeil or in um, cinema are ap applicable here. So things like trompe, uh, sorry, like bluing things out when they're in the background, blurring things out in the background, using things like uh, lighting cues and proprioception. So proprioception is that um, objects move just uh, in different ways depending on my head movement so that I can understand their spatial relationships. So you could... So using those tools that we are familiar with um, in trying to pretend as if they're a dimension are actually really, really beneficial in this situation where we are um, putting people into a dimensional space. Yeah, and even just like, it's, it's one of those things where having some attention to it can help a lot. You don't have to, you know, be completely mimicking like old, like old Renaissance trompe l'oeil painting, though we tried that once. Um, the, uh, but like we just did like a quick two hour lighting pass of a scene that we're working on today. And that had a massive improvement in the, just the sense of depth and the sense of how things were. Uh, so it, even just a little bit of attention to these things can go a long way in VR. And then as we mentioned earlier, sound, sound is so helpful. Sound not only helps the user to think that they're touching something when they're not, but it also can help you to um, direct the user's attention. A lot of times what happens in VR is that the user's looking the wrong way. 
we don't have any control of the camera anymore. It's not like we do in, um, in uh, you know, on a 2D screen where we're constantly directing the user as to go, or even a movie or a video game where we're, we know what camera shot is being used and we can tell what you're looking at um, because we're directing you. In VR, the user is just let loose on that world, and so they could be looking in completely the wrong direction. And so how do you get them to look at that UI element that's accidentally rendering behind them because they got up and moved around? You need some, uh, sound effects are really effective there. We also uh, found some really interesting effects. Of sound. I don't know if I have, nope, I no appear sound. to not have. I set my computer up poorly. So you'll have to imagine for a moment, um, one of the things where we, I was really surprised at how effective sound was, so it, at Leap, we're focused on we're focused on these sorts of interactions. Uh, we don't like my team doesn't get a lot of budget for great you know movie quality sound or nor do we have the time. But even just a little bit of like clicks and bleeps and boops, yeah. we have these little dials and wow. So at work, we're I'm running on a desktop with multiple video cards um, to run this Oculus. So my little MacBook is not happy. But there's this there's these very kind of high detail ver that you have to be. Uh, very dexterous with dials, and when we didn't have audio feedback for them, it was relatively difficult to use them. But once we added just a little bit of a click sound as you were moving through them, the user tests actually just went up in positivity a huge amount. Yeah. And so it was really surprising to me. And also people with our buttons, when we added the proper depress and unpress kind of boop, boop, and just very, like, we threw something very together subtle. really quickly. Um, People went from pressing way through a button and which was causing some, some weirdness and made it so it felt less responsive to just going doot doot and pressing it as if it was a physical button. And so having just a little bit of sound, even if it's not super high quality, can just radically change the usability and the actual impression of your application, making it much more, it feels more reliable, it feels more responsive. So that's a big thing. And we also use sound to Give, our, uh, give ourselves a sense of space and a sense of presence in a huge way. So that can be, it can be a really important thing in your VR experiences. Yeah, it fills out the whole you know, spatial uh, illusion as well. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> pay attention to me. I have put this thing on my head. <laughs> I clearly am committed to you. Commit to me back. Right? You've made me look a fool. I have this weird thing on my head. There's all these sensors that we can use now to determine all kinds of stuff about you as a human being, right? I have galvanic skin sensors. I have eye tracking. I have um, sound. I have, you name it, I can tell it about the human being, right? Um, and so um, if I've gone through all the trouble of putting this on my head, it's really interesting to look at the new sensors and what they can understand about the user. So... If you think about all these sensors and how they can be used together, for example, if I use eye tracking and gesture like we did in the, um, this is not a VR example, but um, Mercedes-Benz, the CES car, um, they used um, eye tracking plus leap motions gesture detecting. And what happened is that you could choose between, you know, you had this, this HUD and you could quickly switch between that menu and that menu over there just by looking and you could be still doing the same hand gestures Right, But the system knew which one you were trying to control because it could tell which one you were looking at. So you can use these multiple sensors to triangulate what the user's intent is. The other thing is that um, humans, the reason that I'm using this image is because humans are um, habitual people. We do the kind of the same things at about the same time in about the same spot every single day. Right? Um, I had a boss, this is really scary, I had a boss um, a few years back that told me that um, he used to be a bodyguard, and he told me that he could kidnap me in a matter of a week just by because I'm the, a habitual person and you always do the same path home, and it would be no problem for him to put me in the trunk if I didn't do what he told me to do. So, <laughs> but this is true. Like, when I was at Microsoft, I did a study of how people, um, I made a bunch of people wear GoPros in their home for a few weeks, and I watched what they did through their space, and pretty much every single person had one spot that they sit on the couch, they had one spot that they sit at at their dining table. Um, in the morning, they looked at a certain number of sites, or certain sites, set of sites, and in the evening, they looked at a different set of sites. They watched um, TV at a certain time every day. That, you know, we have these patterns. 
And you can see that out in the marketplace, people are using algorithms to look at these habitual patterns and to predict what you're going to want from technology next, right? Like, so we have Google Now, we have Amazon's anticipatory shipping, we have all kinds of things out there that can triangulate your data usage. So now, if you're really paying attention to the human, you can start to use um, their senses, like how they're look, what they're looking at, what they're talking about, whatever, um, as a way to triangulate intent and then their habitual use of technology to quickly reduce internet noise, right? Or, in, sorry, interface noise. So you can remove, strip out a lot of the stuff that might be available. Like, we don't need everything yelling at us all the time now in VR because I'm sensing the human. I know what you need. So I can reduce, 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 reduce until it becomes like it's, it's watching me what's going on here. Um, but in a positive way. And even in, like, there, there's the set of things we can do at, at, that are kind of the longer term set of, like, knowing what, what UI to bring up and kind of those, like, in the minute to minute sense. There's also things you can do in the second to second and kind of millisecond to millisecond sense using a lot of these different sensors. So knowing, and that's kind of the eye tracking bit, right? And I've got one sensor that has, you know, a, like, it might, you know, it, it's accurate in this part of the space. It's less accurate over here, things like that. I've got another sensor that's accurate really well over here and not, and less over here. Maybe my eye tracker is great at one thing. My hand tracker is good at another thing. And I've got, you know, maybe a body tracker that can do other things. If you can combine all of this data, you can get a really good sense of the intentionality of somebody from second to second. There's some really cool studies you can pull up on using multiple input devices simultaneously and being far, far more accurate with, oh yeah, that's the button they were trying to press. That's the thing they were trying to do. And all of that's just going to make things feel more responsive. It's going to make users feel like they're in that much more control. So across kind of this whole continuum of, of time, there's a lot of different ways you can be using a lot of different sensors. And it's really pretty cool. Okay. The last on these best practices is use human scale. So, um, my, my practice is about uh, creating superhumans. That's my goal in life. And so I want to encourage all of you to think about uh, using human scale when it comes to um, designing your, your VR applications. And, you know, by that, I don't, I don't mean to say that you can only create uh, one-to-one relationships, right? It's pretty cool to be the, the Alice in Wonderland in some world where you're either way too small for the world or way too big for the world. These are really fun experiences to have and things that you'll never have in the real world and, and VR is a magical place for that. But, um, you know, think about the fact that, um, having my body actually be in the space with me creates a much more immersive experience of that place. It, it keeps me in there. It makes me believe it a little bit more. It also um, helps me to understand my relationship to the scene that I'm in, and it helps me to create this more one-to-one -one relationship with my environment, which is really powerful stuff. The other thing is to think about human scale when it comes to these cognitive functions that I was talking about earlier. Start to think about how the humans really make sense of things, and you can do that in VR, um, feed it back to them in a way that's really powerful. So one of the tricks, especially in the next like year or two, is that we've got these incredibly powerful devices. I mean, anything that's powerful enough to give me these amazing, immersive, incredible experiences, transporting me to all these other places, can also is also powerful enough to do something really traumatic, um, to create horrible experiences and things I never want to have again. And we're at a really interesting inflection point in, in VR. And there's a lot of folks who are kind of worried that if we don't get the design of VR applications right right now, we're going to see kind of another example of the 1990s where VR kind of came up and then sputtered out a bit because the first round of consumers are going to need to have great experiences and really want to come back and try VR again. So one of the things right now if you're developing an application is to make sure to ease people into the experience. You can really, like I was saying earlier, kind of be this overwhelming assault on the senses uh, so you want to make sure you give people time to acclimate. There's um, this is great. I've seen a couple of these great skydiving demos. Um, things like there, you actually have like rip cords to pull and everything. But every one of them starts you seated in an airplane, looking at a wall that's a couple meters away, um, and they give you a chance to kind of acclimate yourself to the space. When I turn my head, this is how much I move. When I reach my arms out, this is how much. This is how far they go. Going back to the inconsistency of everything, we don't have a we don't have a great sense of that. When I even like I spend hours a day in a headset, but when I put on a new demo, I need time to acclimate 
and get a sense for what this demo is doing and what this application is gonna is going to do. So you want to make sure that you can get people to the really exciting stuff. You can get people to the really interesting stuff. Give them a moment to figure out what's going on and don't start them facing a column three inches right. away from their Breaking face. Their so to that point, right, like you want to start them off in a safe environment where they can test things out. Like, oh, I try this. Oh, um, sorry, let me, let me back that up. So when we were working at, uh, on the HoloLens, one of the main goals that we were working on was the idea of building blocks. So teaching users maybe two or three input methods that then they could combine into more advanced inputs and more advanced inputs and more advanced inputs. We see this also like uh, with multi-touch on a touchscreen device, right? Like so when Apple came out with their their iPad, yeah, I could touch things. But then once I figured out that I could touch things, I could touch things with two fingers and different things happen. And I could touch things with three fingers and now different things happen and I could sweat, right? So you're, you're, you created like this really simple baseline that will work everywhere and then combine them together to make more complicated things. But coach them along the way. Don't just dump them in there or they're going to throw up when they see the column. So keep, just keep in mind that people throw up when they see columns. It'll be a good <laughs> mantra for you. And then uh, this is something we keep coming back to, and it's definitely because it's one of the it's one of the biggest challenges right now. We, you've just you've got to scaffold up people for every demo, every time. Right now, if you're unless you're building for some very specific audiences, there's a good chance that your demo or your application or your game is going to be the first time somebody has used VR, and so they're going to need to learn all of the tricks. They're going to need to learn all of the kind of things that VR does. Uh, especially, they, it might be the first time they use a new device. It, there's all of the scaffolding that has to happen. And so that's teaching people about the visual language, teaching people about the interaction language, all of these different things. Yep. Yeah, right. And giving them a chance to test them out in a safe environment, not in the midst of, you know, free falling from an airplane. Right. And so if, um, this is something that games have been dealing with for decades. If you're a game developer, if you're building something new, if you're building something different, if you're, uh, you're going to have to teach people how to use these incredibly complex systems. And a lot of games are hugely complicated. And that goes for something like Farmville. I mean, you, you go from this at the start to something incredibly complicated, like all of this. Uh, and there's no way that someone's going to jump into this. So games have to deal with this all the time. And you can learn a lot from looking at the way they handle the early, early gameplay. They don't have... It's not necessarily, tutorials aren't necessarily boring. They're not necessarily a problem. They can be incredibly fun. And, but they do things like they take away all of these, all the features. And they introduce them one at a time, very, very slowly. And what they do, it'll do something like, hey, uh, we've got these tomatoes. You need to click them. Okay, we've learned how to click them. Okay, we're going to introduce the next thing, which is you need to water your plants. Okay, so you water them and then you click your tomatoes again. And we're making sure that you go through and you confirm, yes, I know how to do this. I've, I've done this interaction. Let's add a little more. Now we do another interaction. And so this sort of thing really helps people to go from, I've initially just learned how to do this, to now I can deal with this incredibly complex, powerful, interesting experience. So that's, uh, it's something to definitely learn from and look at these sort of game tutorials. So um, I think, you know, we've kind of done a really big overview rather quickly. Um, but I hope that you heard some things that are beneficial to you. And, and of course, we're happy to talk to you about uh, any questions that you have. Um, but on behalf of myself and, and Leap Motion, thank you. And Daniel, sorry. Yeah, Daniel thanks so much. And Leap Motion, thank you. <laughs>